Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the debut episode of the Plague Scythe Podcast, your premier source of all things gear, tech, and metal. Brought to you by your favorite D-list guitar YouTuber, although that's probably a little too generous to be honest. I'm your host, Ryan, and today I'm privileged to welcome a friend of the channel as our first distinguished guest. Hailing from Perth, Australia, guitarist for three-piece rock band Ragdoll, fellow content creator and hair extraordinaire, Mr. Leon Todd. <laughs> Leon, thank you so much oh, for dude. doing this. Thank you so much for having me. That's the best intro to anything I've ever had. <laughs> so I think you I think you nailed the three things I do in my life, and that's about it. So <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I, I can sympathize with that. People ask me what I do all day and like I I can't relate with you. Like I sit at home and just play guitar. <laughs> Pretty much, man. Like that's you know, that's it's what a what a you know what an awful thing to have to do with your life. You know, sit around and play guitar. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. And then be able to make a living yeah. on it must be awful as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, well, this uh, this whole that. podcast for those of you joining us is um, basically just going to be a little spotlight into our guests world and um it's i'm really fortunate to have a real musician joining me not just someone that dicks around in their bedroom all day like i do um so i i, I mostly do that i must admit <laughs> that's 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 still me i i don't know if real musicians are an appropriate title but sometimes i get paid to to play <laughs> things so i guess that qualifies you know that's better than a lot of people in the industry from what i understand so yeah that's and that's, that qualifies in, in my opinion. So, uh, Leon, for those that uh, may not be familiar with your work, why don't you introduce yourself? So, I live in, for what I understand, is probably the most isolated capital city in the world in Perth, Western Australia. And, uh, yeah, I like I said, man, I just sort of play guitar a lot. I uh, play mostly with a three-piece original band called Ragdoll. And we've been going for six or seven years now. Um, we've got a few EPs out uh, and a full-length album. And that's been taking up most of my time during that six or seven-year period. And when I'm not doing that, I teach guitar. And the last, I want to say, 12 to 15 months, I've really been getting into the YouTube thing. So, And, you know, man, that's basically how I stumbled across your stuff. Um it was like suggested content. So the algorithm has worked. It has brought us together. Awesome. That's the first success story I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm sure we'll get into it at some point, how, how you started off doing the YouTube thing, but it was kind of like a real happy accident for me um, where I just wanted to. Yeah, uh, I was I, like, actually. Test a camera I got. Yeah. Oh, really? That's funny. Because I saw you had like a bunch of videos dating to what nearly nine years ago, and you know they're a little you know sporadic yeah, yeah. here and there. And then in the past couple of years, when you really started ramping up content, what you know what compelled you to do that? Was it just testing your camera and thinking, oh crap, this is actually really fun? Yeah. So I, there were a few things. Mostly, I think the big thing for me is you know I started out. My dad plays guitar, and he has a workshop, and you know he builds guitars basically as a that's his passion kind of thing you know that keeps wow. him sane and so i've kind of been around uh guitars and music for a long time and of course the last thing i ever wanted to do was be a guitar player um when i was a teenager you know it was like i loved video games and i loved skateboarding and uh i loved playing sport kind of like all the opposite things you know to music i was this sort of like jock nerd basically um and yeah it was I, I i think like for a lot of people you know you start going through puberty and you're just flooded with these chemicals that you don't know what to do with and uh i think music kind of yeah it was there and uh, i i still kind of remember the day where it, like i remember hearing a song that had guitar in it and it all sort of hit me at the same time and it was like oh wow i I like this. I want to be a part of this. And um, yeah, and, and from then it, it really, it sort of became this all-encompassing thing that was, you know, I guess it's it's sort of been the one constant in my life for half of my life now. So um, I'm very, very fortunate to have fallen into it by accident, but obviously doing that and then doing the, um, 
uh, original stuff with Ragdoll. That's just been such a it's and it still is. It's a massive learning curve. Uh, we went from basically being uh, a local band here in Perth, who you know we would maybe play once a month, and um, I guess the best and Perth. You know, we we were talking about this just before where uh, when we first hooked up the chat about. I find there's so many similarities between Australia and especially the Midwest um, in the way in the way you sort of have these you have these big cities and then you have these big hinterlands where you know in Australia it's people are working on the mines. Right. You know, mining is this massive massive industry, um, and obviously you have that and so much more uh, in the states. But there's that sort of analogy where you have these middle of nowhere places where you can still go and play rock music and people will come out to it and they'll have a great time and you don't necessarily get that in the big cities um i think you know there's maybe like five or six big cosmopolitan cities in australia and then the rest of it's kind of these like you know big rural towns um so it's almost like being stuck 30 years in the past you know where people still kind of value live music and um and they love to drink and they love to, you know, just generally be idiots. And uh, playing in a rock band uh, definitely facilitates that. So, yeah, we started doing that. Um, and, you know, so we were either playing our own stuff uh, in the city to no one or we were playing <laughs> some of our own stuff and a bunch of covers to a few people in these sort of mining towns. But um, we, we were able to make a little bit of money doing those kind of gigs, which was nice. And that helped us fund you know, recording our own songs right. and things like that. And um, a friend of a friend passed on our first EP to a guy who booked a side stage at a festival uh, in Oklahoma. And I just got an email out of the blue from this guy one day, like, hey, man, like, love your sound. If you ever want to come and play in the States, like, let's talk. Um, and I was like, this was the start of 2012, I think. So, yeah, six, basically six years ago now. And I was sort of like, well, this is too good to be true, you know, right. but I'll send him a message back anyway. And um, we, yeah, it was literally like one email exchange, like, you know, hey, mate, uh, sounds amazing. Uh, you know, I wrote this like essay, sort of like, you know, like I'm doing right now, like, here's my life story. Uh, and his response was, uh, great, book your flights for, you know, make sure you're here for these dates. And that was his response. And it was like, oh, gee, that was a bit weird. Wow. And about a week later, the uh, poster for this festival came out. And, you know, we were on the poster right down the bottom. But we were on the poster. It was um, amazing. And sort of like we're all standing there going, surely, surely somebody's having us on. This can't be real. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it ended up, you know, like two and a half months later, we're, we're on a plane. And um, we went and did a short tour of the U.S. We managed to record an EP in that short uh, period of time and then that just kind of you know man we were we were on the treadmill um we went back uh 13 14 15 and 16 and um managed to record a few eps and a few albums in that time and um then we went and toured europe in 2016 as well um and sort of just each year it progressively got a little bit better for us um and i think we kind of figured out what not to do and what to do and uh the, the, the flip side is that we went from being this local band here, you know, just a bunch of guys, like uh, the attitude <clears throat> in Australia with musicians anyway is very much like you tell somebody that you're a musician and they say, yeah, 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 that's really cool. So what else do you, like, what's your real job right. kind of thing? <laughs> right. um, it's, it's, very, it's not really a, you know, no one tells you about it at school. Like, oh, you can be a musician and... Uh, and, you know, to be fair, it's a very, very small market here to be a, a working musician. But, um, yeah, and there's that sort of tall poppy syndrome in Australia where people just, oh, yeah, you're a musician, but what do you really do? You know, they sort of love to cut you down. That's sort of the attitude here. But, of course, because we went overseas and, you know, we played a gig overseas, suddenly it's international touring band, yada, yada. And, it, yeah, it was... it. It was really funny how quickly people's attitudes to what we did changed back home. Um, and so I just always say to people, it's in Australia, we're big 
in America and in America would be in Australia. Yeah, that's that's a funny dynamic because it's it's almost the opposite here where if someone realizes that you're halfway talented, they ask you why you have a real job. And I just keep telling them, you know, yeah. uh, have you ever heard the term starving artist? I like to be able to eat, man. Yeah, dude. And, um, and you know, luckily over here, it's um, the first year we went to the States, we went, okay, great. How, how are we going to figure out how to move over here? And then I spoke to some people who played music there. And it's, you know, the, there's a chasm between what you can earn just sort of playing gigs in the States um, and what you can playing here. It's, it's, we sort of sat down and went, it's actually worth our while to, to live here nine or 10 months a year and play and, you know, do, do normal life and then spend the rest of the time, you know, recording and touring and doing all that kind of stuff. So, um, that's, that's probably why I'm still calling you from Perth um, <laughs> rather than somewhere in America. And I've had a few, a few friends from town who have, um, they've, they've moved over there. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's definitely a struggle there, but there is that sort of expectation, which right. is, you know, it's, it's one of those things is always, there's always the upside and the downside to it. Sort of like, well, why, why aren't you doing this a hundred percent? And I think that's <clears throat> the big thing that we learned. Um, from playing it, playing in the states, it's like, hey, you're you're responsible for any success you have. You you know, you don't have to sit around berating uh, people who do or don't come to shows, which seems to be the attitude of a lot of people here. Like, oh, nobody appreciates my music, and there's no scene, and uh, all those kind of things. It's like, man, just just book a flight, you know, like go somewhere and do something, and. Um, but yeah, it's sort of back to that. That's I, I guess that's the story of you know of the band. I think I worked out we we've played fifty or sixty something shows in the states now, which is pretty cool. That's very um, cool. That is a that's an accomplishment, man. It's awesome. And you know, a lot of that's just been like I said, we got that leg up, and then just from that one little festival gig, net, you know, it's it sounds super pretentious, but it was. I didn't realize it was networking because networking over here means that you know you wear a suit and you go to like a cocktail bar on a Friday at some sort of business event put on by a university, and you hand out your business card to a bunch of people who are never going to call you. Yep. Uh, whereas, whereas that's like it's a genuine thing. You're just kind of there, and people say, "Ah, oh, you know, that was a good set, dude." Like, if you're ever back in town, either call me or call my buddy. He runs a venue and. Um, just learning to follow up on those things. Like, okay, cool. Well, if I call these people, they're normally pretty good to their word, which isn't always the case here. It's a very different sort of dynamic. I think because it's so much, it's such a small insular scene here in Perth um, and in Australia. But it's, I think the message that I, I, I get from you and a lot of people who've, you know, really made it is that, um, you can't rely on those record deals anymore. You really got to take self charge if you want, you know, your musical career to work out. Of course, you get your um, your breaks with people that recognize you, that sort of thing. But um, it, you know, sounds like as you guys that were busting your ass and you know making paving the way yourself, you can't just uh, sit back anymore and just expect someone to to find you. <laughs> yeah, and I I think it's one of those things where <clears throat> the our attitude was always well you know, we do this because it's fun and because we get on as a bunch of dudes, like that's kind of the, the first thing. And we like the music that we make and, you know, given all those parameters, well, let's just try to always have a good product ready in terms of having good sounding recordings and, you know, putting the effort into trying to perform well live and being prepared for any opportunities that come along. And, you know, the reality is, it's always the case where, you know, more often than not, the good gigs that we have ended up doing have been risky or it's like, oh, I don't think we're quite ready for that. It's like, well, make yourself ready. Um, and, you know, going going forward after after doing it for a few years, it's we, we sort of learned the hard way. It's like, okay, just be ready. And then if something comes up, hey, what a thing to be grateful for. What a great opportunity. And if it doesn't, well, we're still, you know, goofing around doing what we like and um focusing on the aspects of music that make music worth doing which right. is expressing yourself and you know 
uh, just generally trying to trying to improve. I think that's very much my thing. Um, but yeah, I guess that's kind of the long and the short of it. With the, I don't know if any of that made any sense. No, I can't it's good. You, where you I started. touched on at least like three questions I had, so so it works out. You're you're very efficient already. Oh, great. Uh, one of the things I was deathly curious about, and it's kind of similar in the Midwest, as you said, you have these pockets of. Um, you know, big cities, and then it's just kind of flyover country everywhere else. Yep. What's it like getting started as a you know gigging band when you know Australia just has these absurd drive times between cities? And like I said, you've hit you've hit mining towns that sort of thing, but still, that's got to you know eat into whatever little profit you're making. It's got to be a drain. Oh, dude, like that's such a uh, prescient point to make because I mentioned this to anybody I meet overseas it's sort of like hey you know for example today i did a um thursday friday saturday i did a fill-in with um my friend's band just playing covers we played in this sort of bigger rural town and you know it's an a seven ish hour drive <laughs> um yeah you know and it's like it's not kind of like a seven ish hour drive in america where like Every 15 minutes, there's a McDonald's right. and a Denny's and a gas station and, you know, like a whole little hub of stuff. You drive through these like literal ghost towns maybe once every hour. Um, and there's sort of like one semi big small town on the way. And that's about it. It's like you just kind of smash it for seven hours and you get there and, you know, there's gas stations along the way. But that's about it. It's not like you sort of roll into town and you can go, oh, hey, do we want to go to Chili's or do we want to go to, you know, this or do we want to go to that thing like you can in America? So, um, yeah, it's... Or even, like, when we did Europe, um, it was just insane that we drove through, like, in eight hours, like, three countries. Yeah, um, isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's... Uh, we <laughs> we played this, uh, like, small festival in the south of France and then we had a day off and it's like, oh... You know, we're very close to, like, Nice. That's meant to be really, like, cool. Let's go check that out. Oh, we're also really close to, like, Monaco. Let's go there. Oh, there's Italy, like, another 20-minute drive away. It just, man, it just blew my mind. It's like um, doing that. It takes me, like, 40 minutes to get from where I live to the center of Perth. Uh, yeah, that's that's just insane to me. How's the saying go? Europeans think 200 miles a long distance and Americans think 200 years is a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, um, and I mean, you know, Australia's kind of here because, uh, you know, <laughs> because of the American Revolution as well. So we're sort of even we're like the junior, junior version of <laughs> uh, the USA. Um but yeah, man, it's like that kind of thing. It it really does. It's um, it makes it makes it worthwhile if you're playing, you know. And I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. There was a um, there was a thing recently, like a little like you know local network news thing done. Um, they called it like a like Perth pub band legends or something. And they were talking about the scene in in WA in the eighties, and you were getting cover bands that had their own road crew these are local cover bands um and speaking to a few of the guys i used to work for one of them at a music school he was in a like really popular cover band it was in like the mid 80s they were making 10 to fifteen thousand dollars a night wow uh just doing like three sets three 45 minute sets of whatever was on the radio you know springsteen brian adams that kind of stuff and it was, yeah, they would get, you know, you'd have some venues would, this is like four or five nights a week, at least a thousand people. And um, uh, my, even my, my dad and my uncle played in a band together, sort of at the tail end of all of that. And even they said, yeah, it was just, there were just venues everywhere. You know, if you like had a guitar, you could get a gig. Um, and I was talking to the, to some of my friends about this and it's like, you know, these guys are on this show sort of talking about. They're talking about the glory days, the way you watch like, you know, uh, an MTV documentary about like Poison or Guns N' Roses. And they're talking about the glory days of being on tour. But these guys are in Perth. They're playing pubs and they're playing other people's music. So it's sort of like, that's, that's really, really weird. And then it's, 
somebody, a friend of mine made the point. He's like, yeah, but the 80s in Perth, you're never going to get a big artist come to Perth. Like, big artists skip Perth. You know, people do an Australian tour and it's the East Coast and they always skip Perth. Um, you know, we get like the mega, mega artists, sort of the Adele and Ed Sheeran and Foo Fighters kind of thing. Uh, but a lot of the bands I actually want to see, you know, like they just never make it over here. Um, so yeah, it was that kind of thing. It's because these artists are never coming. These people were playing their music and doing a pretty good job of it. So it's like, if you're a Bruce Springsteen fan, it was like, you could kind of see a big show where they're going to play a bunch of Springsteen songs. You can go out and drink with your friends and have a good time. And that was the scene. And then in the nineties in, in WA anyway, they, they raised, um, the, like the alcohol tax significantly. And it just totally changed the culture around going out like venues just shut down everywhere. And sort of the only venues that were able to stay open were like the small indie venues doing, you know, original music. Um, and there's this, there's still kind of like a big, uh, divide between the original scene and the, the cover scene in, in Perth anyway. And, um, uh, yeah, we're sort of one of the few bands who just, you know, we just started off like, well, we like all this music and we can play it. So we're just going to go and do gigs and, you know, we'll do our own stuff and we'll do, you know, the rest of the rock pantheon at the same time. And uh, the, back to sort of the, the point of the question is that if you can do that, a lot of the time, the, the gigs that are in remote areas pay quite well. Um, uh, where it's, you know, you can go and play a big mining site or something like that. And because it's run by BHP or Chevron or, you know, some giant multinational dropping a few grand to fly a band out to play two nights to keep everybody happy, um, is like, it's a drop in the drop in the ocean for them. So that kind of thing, it sort of levels out with the economy there. But like I said, it's all sort of dependent on mining. If, for us, if we want to go and do a tour that's strictly doing like our original music, it's basically not worth it. Um, mm. We did, we did the East Coast of Australia last year, and like, don't get me wrong, man, like, great shows to go and play. You know, we played smaller clubs, but the culture, like in Melbourne and Sydney, around original music is so much better than it is here in Perth. Like, you know, we sold out Cherry Bar in Melbourne, um, and it's like the second time we've played there, and it's like. Oh, this is pretty cool. We're just playing our own stuff and people sort of dig it and, you know, they're buying merch and, but still it was like, it was the same, it cost us the same amount of money in flights as it would have been to fly return to like Dallas. Wow. <laughs> that is insane. Yeah. It's just like domestic travel here is just expensive. So, so yeah, back to your point, the fact that there's not, you know, and if there was, I'm talking about a distance like going from like Florida to New York, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's like three cities to play. Um, whereas if you did that, you could take three or four weeks and do it in the States. Right. Um, and you know, that's kind of why we went to the States to do it. It's like, well, yeah, we can just book a flight. We can just snail our way, you know, up route 66 basically and play a bunch of cool places. And, um, in the time that it would take us, you know, in the distance that it would take us, sorry you know, to play like two cities in Australia. Yeah. That's, I think that's something people in the States don't really consider. Yeah. We don't get our Amana Marths or Meshuggahs or, you know, all these yeah. um, Scandinavian metal bands that I love over here very often, but oh, dude. Um, you know, some of these more remote countries don't even get the Metallicas of the world. So it, it makes sense. There's a musical scene that's just filling the void. Yeah. And you know, like the, the thing is like the, the music scene I feel in like Australia is very, um, like I said, you know, we're just like an independent band. We're kind of like, we're nobodies basically. And anytime we play overseas, it's because we're a rockier kind of band. We always get people like, oh man, I love Australian music. Here's band X, Y, Z. And you know, bands who have been objectively very successful um, and they'll say, oh, and then, you know, I heard you guys and I, I really liked it because I, I, I hear so much great stuff come out of Australia. Um, I remember the first time we went to the States, someone was saying, oh, dude, like, you know, I love Jet and Wolfmother. Um, 
and you know now you guys are another Australian band who are like that I really like. It's like, dude, we haven't. We're never going to sell anything close to what those guys did. Um, uh, but cool, you know, it's that sort of like. At least you're listening to the music and you're sort of hopefully appreciating appreciating it for what it is. Um, uh, and even then, it's like you know, you, those bands would rarely travel out to Perth to play a show. They they'd be lucky to play to 500 people. Um, so that's kind of the the shame about it. But on the flip side, if you're sort of savvy and organised, you can you can do the covers thing you can sort of play the circuit and you know at least accrue enough money to to have to go and tour independently and not run a massive or you know not run a massive loss on the overall thing something i think we kind of take for granted over here is <laughs> just being able to you know hop city to city even like i've got some friends back home that are in um kind of like a bluegrass band they call it thundergrass because it's a little more contemporary or whatever but you know, they can just oh i like the sound of that already yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty cool um and they can you know just hop from college town you know to the college town and and still you know not roll in cash but at least <laughs> make enough to make it worthwhile that's uh yeah it's an interesting dynamic to me i'm i was i'm wondering um you know you, you've got a lot of uh shows under your belt both in europe and uh the states i've always heard that in touring basically everything but the um, small amount of time you get off to see you know attractions and the big cities and whatever limited time you have to play on stage that's like what makes it worth it but every other aspect of touring just completely sucks <laughs> is that uh accurate um, to your experiences it's it's definitely not for everybody that is the one conclusion i think i've drawn from the whole thing um Man, it's like when we started Ragdoll, we were we were actually a five piece. Wow. Um and I've known yeah, like I've known basically the whole way I got into all of this, which I didn't mention earlier, was I put some demos I made of just me playing guitar on MySpace. Oh rip MySpace. Just like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um and I got a message one day from a guy saying, Hey, you know, we like all the same kind of music. I'm playing in a band that's looking for a guitar player, and this guy, Troy is now our producer um and you know i play duo gigs with him and uh it's sort of like you know the small pool of musicians who all know the same songs and kind of play musical chairs in these cover bands here um he had gone in so he was sort of my in and um he was playing in a band with the guy who is still playing drums in ragdoll now cam and a buddy of ours um mike so it was sort of like the four of us got together. This is like 10 years ago now and started jamming. And then Troy kind of went and did his own thing. He really got into the audio side of things and production. And um, and then we did, I remember we did one country gig, like it was a two hour drive or something somewhere down South. And um, yeah, it was, it was sort of like our first road trip gig. Um, and it was, you know, we weren't, we were staying at, a friend's house we weren't sleeping super rough or anything like that but um i remember after the gig my my buddy mike the bass player he he just kind of said he was like man this um this i don't think this is for me you know this kind of thing like i'm tired and um i'm i'm just in a bad mood and all i've done all day is wait around and you know we kind of had that conversation right um and he ended up um yeah he you know he left and went and did his own thing not long after that and uh he's actually i'll remind me when we finish this up i'll, I'll send you his new band because it's it's really cool stuff um i've been listening to it a fair bit um but uh yeah as an aside so it was sort of one of those things and then the first time man the first time we went to the states was it was so much fun but it was also super rough as well it was we just had no idea what we were in for we'd done a lot of rural gigs in australia like staying in really dingy motels and you know kind of rough towns and things like that so we kind of thought we knew what we were in for but it was just that element of you know america's so for, for us it's it's so familiar because it's i grew up watching american cartoons and movies <sighs> right. and you know like it's like cultural hegemony right um it's that like american soft power that's just like 
omnipresent everywhere. You know, it's you just assume that that distilled vision of it that you get is what it's going to be like. And um, I remember, yeah, we went and spent a few days in LA and, you know, we went and like saw some sites and stuff like that. And then we flew in uh, to Oklahoma City. <laughs> um, and, you know, like it, uh, it always makes me laugh, man, seeing the um, whole political thing. In a, in, and people have said this to me. It's like, you know, whatever your political persuasion is, you know, whenever there's an election, if, the, you know, if candidate X or party Y gets into power, man, like, I think I have to come to Australia because, you know, you guys just seem like you've got it sorted out down there. And um, it's like Australia would be like the bluest, if it was an American state, it would be the bluest blue state that was ever blue. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's a very, where, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, social democracy that's a constitutional monarchy you know it's like all there's all these things that are really anathemic i think to um to a large part of the american populace so it's like flying into oklahoma city it's like i didn't realize oklahoma was like you know the most conservative state in america basically yeah it's um, up there it's definitely and, up there yeah and and dude like it was Everyone there was super lovely, yeah. which I also didn't expect. It's you know we get this like um, mean old I rednecks that just shoot you from the driveway type of vibe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. It's like that's and you know it's like this the thing. It's like oh, Australia's just full of like deadly animals. It's like well, the perception <laughs> is that you know America's just full of rednecks with machine guns ready to gun you down. And um, I I just couldn't get over how generous people were there. But at the same time, um, this sort of like um as you know as you were saying it's that sort of like starving artist thing everybody's like on the brink of poverty basically mm. um where it's like and so many people i spoke to who it's like dude i like you know um i had this great job and everything was going well and i like you know was walking out the door to work one day and i slipped and i broke my ankle and then i got like a two hundred thousand dollar hospital bill yep and it's just like stuff like that where it's just it's incomprehensible for somebody like me for where i came from and you know really it was sort of like wow i yeah those kind of things were very very confronting you know um and it it seems that the you know it's what well, we sort of have this thing in the band where it's always like and it's it, it really is tragic it's like almost every year there's at least one person I know who something just absolutely awful happens to them. Um, where it's like, I mean, for example, we stayed with some friends of ours in Missouri um, one year and it's like, yeah, man, you can't make this stuff up. It's like they came to see us play a show. They drove like, you know, eight hours to come see us play a show in like Texas. They just loved what we were doing, you know, lovely people. And, um, while they were down there, their car broke down. It took them a week to get it fixed. Um, while they were away, their, like, eldest son, like, ran away from home. Holy shit. And then on the, w on the way back, they, like, wrote their car off or something. And then, like, six months later, their house burnt down. Good lord. Yeah, and, man, I'm not even joking. It's, like, something like that happens every year. So, I totally... Dude, I like totally hope that I don't curse you with this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got bad enough luck. You can't hurt it much more. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, that kind of culture shock really back to the, you know, back to the touring thing. It's um, those kind of things and adapting to the climate, uh, you know, the, the social climate and the, you know, I, I, I just found very early on in the whole thing that it's like, you know, if I'm here, I'm not here to talk politics. I'm not here to talk about how people want to choose to live. I'm here to play music and I'm here to, to engage with the people around me. Um, and, you know, try to try to be as generous as them as they're being to me. Um, and, and I really found that that's, that's the, the thing that makes touring very bearable because it's basically, as you said, it's like nine gigs out of 10, it's like, you've maybe eaten something during the day. You've had like half a meal. Right. Um, 
you've like, you know, if you're lucky, you've had like a shower. Um, if you're lucky, you've had like 10 minutes alone in a toilet, which is like <laughs> the ultimate luxury. Um, and then, you know, you get to a venue and you sort of like, you do the load in thing and you set up your own merch and you're tired and, you know, you've driven eight hours or something and, you know, you you've run out of things to talk about in the van. Um, you've listened to all the music on your iPod. Nobody's got any good podcasts to listen to. So you just kind of like, you're just sort of treading water until you can play. And it's um, the thing that, like I said, that makes it tour touring really bearable for me are the people that, that come, even if it's like two people who come to a gig, you know, um, I just find that, especially in the States, man, like there's just this, there's just this warmth that so many people have. So many people who are in, I guess, the scene, whether it's other bands or uh, people who are fans uh, of music. Like if, you know, if, and I think it's just the American way, man. It's like, if something's good, then you guys really hold it tight, you know? Um, it's like, okay, I like this. I want everything to do with it, you know? That gives um, me a little bit of hope considering, you know, I mean, of, all you see in here is about garbage, uh, corporate produced pop tracks. So yeah, uh, I'm glad to hear that you guys have had some, you know, some success and and warm reception by Americans. Yeah, and I think I think the the thing is, it's I wouldn't say that you know the percentage of the population that are what we're into is any bigger, but you know, there's like upwards of 300 million people who live in America. There's like 25 million in Australia. Right, which is like a state <laughs> for us. Yeah, which is like a medium-sized state, you know? Like, um, but Australia is si basically the size of the continental United States. So, um, we sort of, it's almost like there's not the critical mass or there's not the like density level um, in a lot of Australia for those kind of things to happen. But yeah, man, it's... Um, like my small experience with touring anyway, it's you just sort of need to figure out a routine. And maybe the first two weeks, like I was saying, we got to Oklahoma City. We were staying with somebody who was just like, hey, you're in Oklahoma. Let's just eat like wings and burgers for a week, um, <laughs> which is like I've never done anything like that to my body since. Um, after about a week, I was like, dude, I just need to like, I'm going to go outside and eat the grass or something. I need something <laughs> like fresh, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, that was, that's just kind of an experience. Like, hey, hey, there's all this stuff around me. This is, you know, like kids being let loose in a candy store. And that's still my, one of my favorite things in the States, man. It's just like, I love, I love American food. I love American people. Um, you hear about so much trash, you know, but it's like, on on the whole, man, there's just the the people who are good there are really good. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, and like on the flip side, the stuff that's like horrific is often really horrific. Oh, yeah, we we but, do um, it. We do it the best both ways, <laughs> dude. Pretty much, man. Like it's um, it's I I I I guess I can only be like admirable of it because it's just that sort of attitude where it's like if you're gonna do something, like do it properly, um which is the Australian way of things. Like, if you're going to do something, like, well, you should probably go to the beach first and then maybe you should have a beer <laughs> and then maybe you should talk about it. And then, uh, is it really going to change that much? Nah, don't worry about doing it. So, um, yeah, there's, I think there's just, you know, like, I'm, I'm so lucky to live in such a beautiful part of the world. But, you know, the flip side as well is that it's like, you know, Australia kind of, you know, it's like a big island. It runs on island time. So you want anything done. And, um, but yeah, sort of back on track to the touring thing. Um, the, the big difference, there's, I, I did find a big difference between um, doing what we were doing in the States and doing what we were doing in Europe, um, where, you know, there's a culture around independent music in the States. It's sort of like you have the super commercial stuff, as you mentioned. Um, that's sort of forced down everyone's throats. And it seems to be on the coast, that's sort of the, the pop R and B rap kind of thing. And that in the Midwest, it's like country music in inverted commas. Um, uh, 
definitely in inverted commas because it's just it's the same thing with just like a twang to the accent you know yep that's what and i've always like said telecaster. i've always said that exact thing we we call it bro country um so like if it's oh, dude, past, i was just gonna say bro country. yeah but it's if it's like past the year 1992 then most likely it's a pop song with some dude who has a draw and a twangy guitar it's exactly what i say like i got my truck and i got my girl and her daisy jukes it's like you could yeah it's like yeah all right cool um man if you want to have a real giggle listen to some australian country music oh boy jesus oh boy <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll send you some stuff it's it's pretty funny um but yeah like sort of there it's what I found, and sort of more like, we're always either the heaviest band on the bill by like a mile. You know, we'll be playing with like a bunch of bands who sound like um, 1975, basically, you know, like Led Zeppelin, kind of real bluesy rock. And then we come out and it's riffs and like chugga chugga. Or we play with bands that sound like Pantera upwards, you know, so we're this kind of like where the like soft melodic part of the show um and especially playing playing in texas where we played a lot it's like you know um like people really it's just like every second kid has a dime bag guitar and a black label society shirt yep. you know um and they can rip as well which is like wow this is kind of cool you know um i like this stuff and uh man we sorry i'm just yeah i'm doing my thing i'm tired i'm flying on tangents we played at this place called um the rail club uh in fort worth and it's like you know so many people who go there went to school with dime and vinny and um the people we stayed with uh you know they were good buddies with vinny and that kind of thing which was like oh my god wow really <gasps> um for us and um we were playing a show at this place called the rail club and um they they have like a big gig in Dallas every year called Dime Bash. And, you know, it's it's a bunch of band like sort of, you know, southern metal bands basically. And they normally have a big headliner like a down or, you know, um a crowbar or somebody of that kind of sort of caliber, which is always kind of cool. But um the people who who run that were there and they were there, they had their like, you know, ten year old kid with them. Um and it, he was like a mini me Phil Anselmo, like he had the like Cowboys era sort of mohawk. <laughs> um, and this is like the middle of the gig. This kid's like at the front just rocking out. And um, I like said something over the mic and I was like, man, it's like, you know, it's cool to see the next generation of like metalheads being formed right here. And his mum's like, oh, he like, he can sing walk, you know? No shit. And we're like, get him on stage then. Um and it's like, you know, that sort of moment when like everybody in the venue is looking at you. And this is like in Fort Worth, you know, this is like, <laughs> like I was saying, it's like, man, that's like, for, for that's where Pantera are from. And this kid gets on stage and we like start playing the riff and he just starts killing it. Like this 10 year old kid He's like throwing all the fill moves and he's doing like the jump. And it was just amazing, man. And it's like, it's at that point I remembered I don't know how to play that song. Uh oh. <laughs> and it was just like, I'm looking around at, at Ryan, our bass player, and he sort of knows it. And then Cam, our drummer, is just like, dude, I've like, I've listened to this song. I've never tried to play it. And there's just all these like diehard true believers there. Oh, and it's no. like, it went from this really awesome feeling to like, oh, oh no, like I'm totally going to like ruin everybody's night here. Um, and luckily this kid was awesome and nobody noticed that we didn't know how to play the song. <laughs> yeah, enough alcohol um, generally but, that'll cover but, up about everything, any mistakes you can make. Yeah. So so the point of this tangent that I'm saying is like, it, it seems to be that like, especially in like the rock and the metal scene there that um bands are held to a certain standard i feel uh which is quite a high standard and then people will come and watch you once and they make up their mind whether they're going to respect what you do and if they respect what you do then you've got that respect from the musicians and the crowd and the next show you do there will just be mental it'll be really really cool whereas playing in europe it was like rather than that sort of like you know 
I sound like such a dork saying it, but that's sort of like street cred or that right. respect from your peers. It's just if you're a musician, that's a respected profession. You know, you're a professional. We 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 get what you do. Professionals should be paid. You know, there's a hotel provided for you. It's it's a very very much like you sort of don't have to you don't have to crack skulls to get people to on your side. You know, it's just like people come and they're there to watch. Um and they clap for like exactly 22 seconds after a song and then they're ready for more. Um, right. So that's that's the big difference, I think, in the culture between uh, playing rock music, I found, in the States versus uh, in Europe. In Europe, it's just like, well, you're part of the musical profession, so we respect what you do. And now we're going to like, you know, sample what you do and uh, try to get into it. Whereas in the States, it's more a thing of like, okay, are these guys like, are these guys legit? They are. Let's go stupid and have a great time. Yeah, I don't know what the what that's a byproduct of, um, but I, I don't know if it's just Americans have extreme cases of ADHD. But <laughs> I think you're right. It's kind of like if you, if you don't make them groove in the first thirty seconds, then it's just like okay, well, I'm I'm not paying attention to you ever again. But um, you know, you hook them, and it's just like well, now I'm a you know, I'm a, like the last Black Label Society show us all. Um, corrosion of conformity opened up oh, for them and yeah. so many people there didn't know who they were oh wow and then by the end of the night they're like i've got to buy every shirt they make or i've got to get every album and it, 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 they do turn that fast so it's <laughs> it's funny hearing that, that hearing that from an outside perspective as well yeah man it's like there's uh it's it's sort of like one of those things you know where it's like you see like you watch a movie or something and it's i guess it's like you know some guy or it's like, you know, a superhero dude or something, you know, and he, he doesn't realize that he's got this power. And then he goes and, like, he tries to join, you know, like, the big boys and sort of, like, join the club. And they kind of, like, haze him. And it's like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. We've seen heaps of people like you. But then he does something amazing. And it's like, all right, you're, you're a legit dude. We actually really need you. Like, join us kind of thing. Or like a gang movie or something. Yeah. Um, uh, or like Fight Club. That's that. That's probably the best analogy. Actually, it's kind of like Fight Club. Like you rock up and you got to prove yourself, and then from then on, it's like just an unspoken thing. Like, all right, cool, you're part of the club. You get what it is. But man, I learned so much from just watching watching other bands who um, who we played with there, and a lot of local bands who, as you said, it's like they just hook people, man. Like. They, they come out and, you know, the first 30 seconds or like you see them and they just look like every other band. It's like the, the bass players, you know, he's playing like some weird shaped bass with cargo shorts and he's staring at the ground doing windmills the whole time. And the guitar player has a huge goatee and a Zach Wilde, you know, Gibson or Epiphone and the drummer's got this massive double kick kit. It's like, ah. Oh, here we go, they're just going to be like, you know, a Black Label or Pantera sounding band. And then it's like, whatever they do, it's like, it can be the furthest removed from that kind of thing, but it still has those real elements of like, like there's like a bottom line in terms of like groove and like attitude that bands seem to have. Um, even if it's like a glam rock band, you know, they just still understand that sort of like primordial thing that rock music does to people right the good ones do at least <laughs> yeah oh and you know just to clarify i've definitely played with more terrible bands than good ones um I, but that's I, would, just, I can imagine yeah that's just kind of but having said that nearly all the bands we've played with have been lovely guys so even if they've been a really unrehearsed you know green band they've been they've been cool and they kind of get they get what it's about you know it's more about the community and the that sort of aspect of like hey i'm i'm part of this thing that's bigger than me i'm not trying to be this huge rock star it's just like i want to move people the way i see people move when i see a big band play um i think that's what it, that's kind of my why i got into music it's like you see somebody on stage and they're you know they're evoking these responses out of the audience it's like wow that's that seems like something that's real. Yeah, that's that's something that you can't get sense. at your day job very often. So it's it's definitely oh, dude, tempting. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's kind of cool to hear that. I guess that's been your experience as well. Um, whereas, like, if you play music in Australia, just no one respects you. You know, it's like I was watching your um, the video you did recently, your hundredth video, where it's like you said something, and it's like. Let's watch the kid who looks like Jesus play some poison licks or whatever it was, you know, like pretty much like the long haired kid who plays guitar. It's like, yeah, that was me at school. <laughs> uh, we can all I think everyone in this position can empathize with that. And that that's honestly kind of what killed my desire being from back ass, you know, country. Everything's everyone's just stuck in their high school years basically yeah man and you got your small pocket of teens like me who actually you know tried to push the envelope and look into more progressive types of music it's just gigging and doing parties always ended up just being hey play the four chord acdc song <laughs> play this and at some point i'm just like i'm not a jukebox dude i've i we practice a set list we don't know infinite amount of music and that's what we're going to play and it, you know, at some point it was like, okay, I'm done with that for a while, but yeah. still I, I get the itch. I still want to do it. It's, it's a catch 22, man. Like you want to be out there playing. And then when you're doing it, it's like, geez, um, this is kind of killing the buzz for me. And then as soon as you stop doing it, it's like, I want to be out there again. Right. So it's, it's sort of about how do you find that balance, you know? And, um, like, honestly, dude, I think like what you're doing is it's the smartest way to be going about promoting your original music. It's like, you know, if you know slightly more than the average guitar center employee, you're considered like a genius on the internet, you know? Um, so you, you're way better off having a YouTube channel with like diverse content and sort of going, hey, here's stuff that you probably don't know how to use and here's how to use it. And here's how to do cool stuff with it. So you don't have an excuse not to practice or not to try to write music. Um, which like that thing you did with like the free VSTs. It was like, I, I remember watching that and going like, man, I'm just going to show this to all of my guitar students. Um, because if they, you know, they don't have to have, they don't have that excuse anymore of like, oh, I really want to get into recording my own stuff, but it's expensive and I don't have money. It's like, it doesn't have to be get a $100 interface, man. And like, watch this, you know? Yeah. That's, that's kind of my whole goal with a YouTube channel. I, I appreciate the feedback on it. Um, in, in one instance, it's literally, I just, that's, you know, one aspect of it. I, I want to get people to a better place where they feel they're capable of, you know, writing and getting their musical vision out there without, you know, dropping so much money and, and learning quicker than I did. You know, a lot of this stuff I, I try to talk about is trial and error. And I'm trying to, you know, pass on the, uh, you know, the same knowledge that a lot of the Knights in Shining Armor did on the early forums, <laughs> you know, talking about uh, what the best distortion pedals and all that kind of stuff was when, you know, when I was growing up. Um, and the second part is, I think you nailed it, is just kind of a digital resume of showing, you know, what I know, what I'm capable of playing. And um, I, I think that's a much better way of going about it than just hopping from cover band to cover band and, and you know, trying to use that as real world experience if and when that day comes again. Yeah. And I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, I think the strength that you've got with your channel is that it's like most of the people who are going to be watching these videos are guys who don't play in bands um, and they want to know how to get an inspiring sound at home or how to stay motivated at home because guitars or music's an, ex an escape for them right? Um, rather than a job. I think when you release that original eight string song, it's like I, I got excited when I saw it popped up in my YouTube thing. It's like, oh, cool. Like original music, I kind of get to hear, you know, I'm acquainted with the sort of like style of the channel and I've had all these little teasers about what it's like. Now I get to see this guy really do his thing. And um, it was a great song and like a really well put together video. So oh, thanks, man. I thought that was a very, very clever move. Yeah, that's uh, it's one thing I want to get more into. But it's, I again, back to Americans with ADHD. It's like I have 
so many projects I'm working on and every day I wake up with a different favorite and that's the one I want to go do. And then the next day I want to do something else. And then it's just, I, I sit there and like, like I said, and, um, the update, I, I think it, that just means it, it needs more time. Yeah. And it's an interesting angle as well, because I think, you know, as you were saying on your thing, it's like, Oh, baby dime bag. Oh, Zach wild. That kind of thing. It's, you know, there's that element of, okay, cool. These are like almost the lowest common denominators in terms of, you know, what's popular with guitar music and heavy music, but there's this whole universe out there and um, being able to channel that sort of uh, still to totally do your own thing. There's going to be a bunch of people who already like, you know, the Meshuggas and, um, you know, if they're into guys like Ola England online and that kind of thing, it's going to appeal to them. Yeah going to appeal to the sort of like um the the guys who love pantera and bls and that kind of thing like we were talking about and then you're also just exposing people to new music um whether it's because you know they're there because it's like hey it looks like jesus or if it's because they want to know how to use you know a fractal ax8 how to get like a better sound or something or um where to spend their money i think it's a it's a cool it's a cool solution to all these conundrums we've been talking about. Yeah, going off of that, if I could give a quick shout out to your channel, which I think is freaking awesome. Um, that kind of reminded me of the, um, as you said, you, you stumbled on mine with uh, recommended videos. Yeah. I, I remember like early on, I would see some comments from um, users and think their user picture uh, the profile picture just looked too professional <laughs> and you were among those. Right. Uh, so you know, most of, most of the time you get like the blank uh, YouTube icon or you get someone with like some stupid meme as their yep. picture. But I remember seeing um, someone that like it, it, I reverse searched them on Facebook and as I thought they ended up being in a band and um, then I saw you on a couple of videos and I was like, and this, this guy must be like a, math teacher or something like he's got all these books and stuff yep. in the background and then i you know started searching through your channel i'm like oh crap this dude can shred yeah well man it's like i went to university for four years and did the math thing and um that's you know still something i'm really it's it's the thing that really made me interested in the whole digital guitar rig thing actually it was um i was reading some stuff that it's like oh I remember studying that at university. Ah, oh, that's it. Like, you know, like the whole science of how to make an impulse response, for example. It was like, oh my God, I'm actually finally reading about something that ties together these two very disparate threads of my life. Um, which was like, well, I think I know how to make these things now. That's kind of cool. Um, and, you know, stuff like that's always cool. But yeah, it's, you know, it's sort of like... Um, for me, it's, I've just had a YouTube channel from back in the day where it was like, there was sort of no distinction between a user and a content creator. Right. I think that's really sort of developed heavily in the last five or six years. And I just used to do it just like, you know, there's still like the most popular video on my channel is something I did. I bought a GoPro and I was like, oh, I guess I could do guitar videos with this. And I did one video and I was like, ah, oh, I hate the sound of my voice, whatever. I'll just leave it up there and you know it's had 60 something thousand views and it's like yep. don't you hate that yeah and <laughs> it's like why know, can't i get that on my new videos that i put so much more work into yeah exactly and it's like i went back and watched it it's like ah, oh, actually this isn't too bad i understand why people would do this and man like 70 percent of the comments are just like it's it was the middle of summer here so i had a fan on and it's like my hair's blowing in the fan. It's like, well, there you go. You basically turned yourself into a meme. Well done. That's why people are liking this video. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, you know, like I said, it was sort of like doing... Um, I met my wife in the States in uh, 2013, and she's a photographer. Um, and she was she was working at a music venue, and long story short, through a, through a mutual friend this mutual friend recommended her as somebody to do photo and video stuff. And, um, we, uh, that's how I got in touch with her, um, to do some of the band stuff. And then we started hanging out and, you know, now we're married and she lives in Australia. So, um, that's, that's one d definitely positive outcome of, uh, playing music at least. But, um, 
yeah, from her background in sort of photography and, you know, doing stuff for her friends' bands and putting together videos and stuff, um, I the thing that kicked me up the backside was uh, I think when we were on tour in 2015, um, I got offered a thing to do like a, like a video lesson for Guitar World magazine. Um, our PR guy who we were using at the time hooked that up. I was like, it was like the one good thing he did because um, there wasn't a whole lot of like other stuff um, that sort of came out of that. It was like we spent a lot of money and, you know, we got a few interviews and things like that out of it. But, you know, I got to be on the Guitar World website. Whoa. Um, and they were like, you know, can you just put – they sent me like a sample video. And I was like, man, I cannot do stuff like this. Like, how am I going to do this? And she looked at it and she was like, that's – that's like one camera angle and a few lights like um and yeah basically it's i got her to help me out doing the video and then like i was saying i i think it was like testing out a like a gopro or something so i did like oh how can i like record my new ax8 and do a few videos with that um and it was like i did that and i was like man this camera sucks in low light <laughs> she was well, like just struggle. use my camera yeah, man. Um, what do you use out of curiosity? Um, a Sony A6000, A9000, something like that. It's not a DSLR. It's mirrorless. Right. Um, yeah. Just 1080p, 60 FPS. Yeah. Well, that, just, just a regular camera. That, that's cool. I'm using her, um, her Canon, which is like a great camera, um, you know. So it's sort of like I, I pinch that whenever I can. And, um, <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, she, she always giggles. It's like, man, you use this thing more than I do now. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's become an addiction. Um, but yeah, and just what, sort of getting curious, it was like, how do you, you know, how do you use editing software? And, um, I basically owe it all to her because she was patient with me. Um, when, when it was like, and if you go back and watch a bunch of my videos from a year ago, even it's like. I had no idea about lighting or like camera angles or anything yeah. like that. It's sort of been like, you know, maybe the last two months um, where it's like, I've actually been able to watch people's videos and go, that looks really good. I can see how they're doing it now, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, and you know, like my videos aren't the most amazingly produced things. They're often just like one or two camera angles. And, um, but it's, I've managed to get it to a point where it's, pretty streamlined you know um it's like if i want to do a video it's like okay cool i can map it out in my head and pretty much just press record and get it done um and yeah that's that's the hardest part of content creation for me yeah you know it's like my channel went from like a few subscribers to like a thousand pretty quickly i was like ah, oh, that's kind of cool and then a bunch of people who were watching the videos were finding me on Facebook or finding the band on Facebook and listening to the music. Um, and it was sort of like, oh, actually, this is this is quite a cool, like, backdoor in to get people into, you know, the sort of original music I like. And, you know, for, for us, it's, you know, there's, I guess, a lot of guys who like stuff from the 80s like us because we're quite a melodic band with a singer who's got that, you know, sort of gravelly rock voice and range but then we also get a lot of the guys who like you know the the groovy riffy stuff we were talking about and also the whole grunge thing as well which is i always find so funny because i'd never liked grunge growing up you know all my friends were, <laughs> me either that's that's funny that you attract that crowd yeah all my friends were listening to nirvana and i was listening to like winger um and it was just yeah it's sort of like I, and, you know, like, unfortunately, I, I sort of wrote a lot of good music off, you know. I remember listening to Alice in Chains for the first time and going, oh, this is nothing oh, yeah. like what Love I expected. It's sort of like, and listening to Soundgarden going like, geez, I just wrote this off because, you know, I didn't like it when I was 17. And, you know, that's not really a great way to um to <laughs> to map the rest of your life out. So... But yeah, it's it, it's it's been a it's been a cool thing, sort of that way. And I, I guess the other person that really pushed me to do it, um, a friend of mine. Uh, there used to be sort of before Facebook, there was a there was a local forum in Perth called PerthBands.com, 
which is just the place to go to talk crap like we're doing now, you know? Um, and um, he, uh, and it's so, it's so funny. I just always remember him, you know, his username was Johnny C. Um, you know, his name's John. And it's like, that was his username on Perth bands. And I just still in, in my head, he's that guy. And he just started tinkering around um, making like pedal kits and he started making pedals. Um, and, oh man, I think I bought a pedal off him, like a modified super overdrive or something. And, you know, like we sort of got in touch one way or another. No, he, he built, he, he built a pedal for a friend of a friend of mine. And then my friend got a pedal built because of that. And then I tried and I was like, this is amazing. I want this guy to build me a pedal. And he built me a pedal and he was like, what do you want for the artwork on? And I was like, I don't know. So he just took the Ragdoll logo and put it on a pedal. And I was like, dude, you made me like my own signature pedal. This is so cool. Um, That's awesome. And I started, I, he asked me to do like a video demo where he came and filmed it all. And I just played um, and sort of through staying in touch with him, um, he's really been like, dude, push your YouTube channel, man. That's the that's the path to go down. You know, you can really diversify your audience and you can get people into your original music, which is one thing, but it's also a good way to, to do what you love, which is basically just being a gear nerd, you know? Um, right. <laughs> and, and be part of that community. And, um, yeah, I think, I think for me, it's, I just, I just like making the videos, you know, it's like, it's almost like a Zen thing for me. It's like, I love sitting there and editing them and, I just get in this headspace where I'm not thinking about anything else. But at the same time, it's sort of like, you know, man, there's so much really bad information or like just, <laughs> it's like fake news. You know what I mean? Um, when it comes to gear, like, you know, <clears throat> there's so many forums and chat groups where people just talk about stuff and it's like, you know, this is better than this. This $500 overdrive pedal is better than this one because of whatever reason. And, um, it's nice to just sort of go, well, here's some data. Like your Tonewood video thing, man, like perfect. Like why is there a debate about this? Well, no one really has any data. That's, that's one of the things that always drives me insane about this hobby. And I, I know it's that way in every other hobby that you assign, especially music, where you assign so much more artistic value to, to gear, yes. to you know, allowing you to get a certain sound or whatever. But I mean, you're going to run into brand loyalty and, and all of that kind of stuff and, and everything. I, I, I'm a PC hardware oh, nerd yeah. as well, and it's <laughs> it's even worse there. Oh, man, I can um, imagine. And and for that, you can assign numbers to, you know what I mean? It's like you can say this hardware does this amount of frames per second, plus or minus whatever um, percentage, um, and, and yep. people still get emotional over it. So yeah, I don't know yeah. how you go about solving that problem you know what i mean in in music besides doing the kind of stuff we do and just show objectively what something sounds like yeah you know and i i'm sure you get the same thing where it's like hi uh great video um i was wondering can you make a patch which replicates jimmy page's live tone from 1972 the concert <laughs> they played like the third song of you know the second set at you know some bootleg and it's like you know that yeah let me get right on that <laughs> it's like that's just totally missing the point you know um it's yeah and it's 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 and you know i um have a lot of people i have a lot of people get in touch with me over my facebook page with with questions like that and um you know it's like it's it's cool like i i, I love to chat to people about gear and um a lot of the time it's just sort of it's more a case of like well rather than you ask me how to do something it's like what do you actually want to be able to do with this like why right. do you want to sound that way i can hold your hand but it doesn't help you in the long run and that's kind of i'm yeah making a behind the scenes video of how i go about my own tone patch creations to drive home that very point i can sit here and you know try to dial in stuff all day but if it ultimately it's you that should know why this works that way when you're trying to get the sound you do then you know the process yeah and like intent is a very important part of it you know it's like definitely i think there's sort of like 
the place you come from as a musician, you know, without, without sounding as tinfoil hat as I look, um, you know, there's this like, um, I'm most, most people who make music that I've spoken to kind of agree. It's like, there's, you know, you, you basically the easiest way to say it is like, you know, you can't teach someone how to have a soul, right? You know, that's the, that's the most important part. You know, whether you're a very religious person and your idea of what the soul is relates to this metaphysical thing or whether you're the complete opposite and it's more about, you know, an inner feeling that you have. Um, however you want to define it, that's still, you have to come from that place when you're doing it. And um, at the end of the day, the, the stuff you use to do it, as long as it's not getting in the way of that process. Um, and it seems to be that's the, I think that's where people kind of kind of lose the plot a little bit and start shouting at each other in caps lock on the internet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll start calling you every uh, homophobic slur under the under the sun. Oh, uh, yeah. Got those a couple times. Those are, all, those are always fun. Man, I loved um, on, because uh, I always read the comments. It's like, you know, you got to stay entertained somehow. Oh, exactly. There was a thing where it was just like, you know, there'll be 20 comments of like, you know, you play a like note for note Zach Wilde solo. And it's like, you know, I watch somebody do that and I go like, dude, that is like, that's awesome. I'm not dedicated enough to learn something like that note for note. You know, I'm like, I'll spend five minutes and then I'll lose concentration. And the next thing I'm like, you know, finding whether 82 hertz or 81 hertz sounds better, like to boost something, you know, in a patch. So yeah, it's like, oh, I probably shouldn't have spent an hour doing that. Maybe I should try and make some music. But, um, you know, you have like 20 really positive comments and someone's like, you suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's never more than that. Never any constructor criticism. It's just like, lol, you're gay. You suck. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's like, oh, well, well how, do you, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And, you know, it's not necessarily somebody doing it specifically trolley it's just like that's they watched it and that's what they got out of it um yeah and it's it's like well you know fair enough fair enough you know if that's if that's how you feel about it i'm gonna go back and read the other 20 okay comments and you know take those with as much of a pinch of salt as well as the other ones so um right that's a perspective it's hard to keep because um, you know, you remember those stabbing comments of them pointing out every little flaw, especially the constructive ones. It's always, you know, the little, oh, you suck. That sounded like garbage. When you have 20 other comments saying, hey, good job. This has really helped me. I remember that and it doesn't bother me. Yeah. But when you get someone that nitpicks every little flaw, it's it's hard to keep focused. It's It's hard to drown that out and say okay i just got to get better and keep moving on you'll hear that nagging voice <laughs> all the time as you're making videos going oh no i'm actually doing that thing again it's annoying me now yeah yeah big time man um and it, it, the same thing applies to making music as well you know yeah um like i can name every like really poorly written or bad review we've ever had like almost oh yeah remember that one remember that one remember that person who wasn't even at the show and they said we sucked um kind of thing and then it's like you try to focus on a good one and a lot of the time the good ones are just like you know they're they're almost as bad where it's like they're they're just glowing but there's nothing constructive about them and it's like okay cool could you maybe try to identify what i did well um, rather than just right. telling me that it's good or that it's like, you know, rock and roll, man. Like, yeah, it's still alive. It's like, well, <laughs> can... <laughs> it would be nice to know what you really liked about it and maybe what could be done better next time, um, which is, and yeah, I always, I, I, I've found that with the YouTube thing. It's like the more questions I ask, the the more the more I can get out of it. You know, if somebody says, hey, this helped a lot, it's like, well, can you tell me more information about it um, to try and sort of build it up, I guess. So, um, but, you know, having said that, it's, I like, I make more m money from YouTube 
in a month than I do from like streaming royalties in a year by like a factor of about 10 to 1. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't make a lot of music uh, money from YouTube, really. It's like, you know, maybe like a hundred bucks a month or something. Um, yeah. And then I've not even broke that threshold yet. Right. <laughs> so I was trying to tell one of my, a friend of a friend that's like getting started on it. He's doing some like, um, I don't know, like sports apparel, that kind of stuff, reviews. And, right. and I, I told him just like, you better love it because you're not going to, you know, this better be something that you would tell yourself you would do anyway. And that's kind of where I'm at with it. That's why I don't care how successful it is monetarily because, you know, mixing my own music and um, looking at different gear or stuff I would be doing anyway. So just to be able to pay for a little of it by doing so is always a nice um, uh, side effect of that. But yeah, you cannot go in in the year 2018 and expect to make a career off of this like you could 10 years ago. Yeah, man, like, you know, really the measure of success, I think, would be um, where can you get to the stage where you get some free stuff out of it, um, where somebody says, hey, we've got this plugin, we'll give you a license, can you review it for us? It's like, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I'll I'll yeah. do that because the I, first time that happened to me, I I could not believe it. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's like what? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, man. I'll do you the greatest video I've ever done in my life. You know, um, that kind of thing. So that's that's cool. But like I said, for me, it was like you know, I my buddy who makes pedals. I'd done some stuff for him, um, and he was always very generous. Like you know, if I send you if I send you one of these pedals, can you do something? And it's like, yeah, dude. Like you know. I still want to pay you for this because I think it's worth it kind of thing. And um, now it's, you know, I'm uh, uh, basically, you know, working with him, which is kind of cool. It's like I sort of do his like social media and things like that, which is um, which is like a really cool thing to have, you know, like somebody who you can go back to with feedback and say, hey, you know, I was mucking around with this pedal and I know you made it for a particular, you know, you like we did this thing recently where he's trying to, he's like designing a pedal to work with a particular type of amp. Um, and we were playing around with it and just kind of using it. It's like, actually, what if we plugged it into that and I'll tune down and it's like, dude, this is like, this would be really popular with like gent guys because of the way the pedal works. Like, ah, oh, yeah, that's cool. You can kind of bounce off one another and, um, you know, reviewing something and if the person who's got you to review it actually gets something out of it, it's kind of making the product better for everybody who's going to use it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I think it goes back to your whole point about networking and it takes several shapes nowadays. So that's just another angle you have to hit. Yeah, man. And it's like, you know, for example, it's like, uh, I think when I stumbled across your channel, it's like, okay, like, this is very good content. This is really clear. This is, like, the only difference between this and Ola England is that he gets more free stuff to try. Um, and it's, like, you know, if you get yourself to that position, man, like, you, your habit's taking care of itself, I guess. Um, I appreciate that comparison. Any, <laughs> any comparison to Ola, I will take well, as a compliment. I, I, like, I like it better, personally, but because um, I find... Um, he, like, Ola seems like a really cool dude, um, but it's, like, a good exercise in making everything sound like every other piece of gear he has. I'm probably going to get a whole bunch of heat for that comment. <laughs> you know, he's great. Like, I like what he does. But there is that element of, like, his, you know, my signature guitar and my signature ramp, and we're, we're trying a boost pedal or something, and it's... Sha -ga 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 -ga. It's like, well, yeah, on a on an amp that is literally like the highest gain amp in the world and doesn't even need a boost pedal. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is which is like, oh no, shit! It sounds good. Crazy how that works. Yeah, exactly. I imagine though the there'd be so much pressure with that kind of thing. I know he did like a review of the AX8 and like mistakenly said that it had relay switching, and I saw somewhere in the forum someone was like. How do I set up this relay switching thing? I bought it based on this guy's review. Uh oh. Um, yeah, that's like my nightmare. Is like, hey, you can, you know, here's a thing that I've got, and here's some misinformation, and somebody goes and buys it, and like, 
Yep. You know, it, That's my it nightmare starts, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm responsible for this, um, which uh, would suck big time. But yeah, it's, it'd be a, seeing the kind of bigger YouTube guys um, have to deal with that. It's, it's like a, at the same time, it's a whole new level of responsibility. You, um, right. you know, then that actually becomes, um, you know, if you're doing reviews for somebody or you're endorsing somebody, it's like, you know, you're, you're responsible. You're part of the team, you know, um, and can you maintain your integrity without just, you know, without just becoming a shill for something, which, you know, a lot of the guitar channels out there are, it's like, you know, uh, like the Andertons Mesa cab clone thing. Oh my God. <laughs> that video. Oh boy. Yeah. That was painful. It was like, oh man, really? Ugh. That's the advantage I think of being at our size, even up through the 50,000 subscriber level is not having those endorsements and, and having the freedom to say when something sucks by a company that I like, you know, I'm, there's, I love Moore's, micro preamps i love my randall thrasher both of those companies make products that suck and yeah, if dude. i got one for free i would say that um so and i don't want to be bound by some clause in a contract saying i can't so it, it has its ups and downs yeah you got to pay for it but at the same time you get correct information out there i feel like yeah exactly you know and it's um i think i think it's it's a response i i, I find it's like it's just like a responsibility to yourself where it's like, okay, cool. If I want to make, if I want to have good sounds. I want to make good music. I need to be honest about this stuff and evaluate it in a way that's um, transparent. And a lot of the time I do videos so that I can go back and watch them a month later and be like, oh, I can actually make up my mind about something now. Like now that I've got some distance from it, um, I can decide whether it sounds good or not. That's that's a good way to look at it. I, I don't do that enough, I feel like. Speaking of uh, gear in general, one of the similarities like we touched on is we between our channels, we both obviously love the Fractal Audio AX8. Oh, yes. Um, you know, do kinds of tutorials and stuff. I um, think it's safe to say we're both kind of fangirls of that piece of gear. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully um, did, this podcast becomes the biggest thing. And to say thank you, they both, you know, give us free stuff and... Uh, we Amen can, we can to both that, say my friend. And matter of, the, matter of fact, for all the stuff that, you know, especially you've done for, um, you know, putting up patches and that kind of thing, I would nominate you for an AX8 successor right now. Not that my, <laughs> you know, opinion carries any weight, but. <laughs> oh, man, I'll probably just go and buy one when it comes out anyway. I will so, too. You know, it's Who are like, we kidding? Yeah. Um, but yeah, just for posterity, you know, because this is going to blow up and become the biggest thing ever. They, they're so good. They're the best thing. And um, I'm saying this not out of contractual obligation fingers crossed <laughs> um <laughs> yeah no yeah. man but yeah sort of sort of back on topic um yeah i it's it's cool like i tried um your black label patch the other day and um it was like it was a little bit spooky and when i was looking at the settings it was like all right like factoring in different guitars and different monitoring environments this is pretty much how i dial in an amp um which is, it's it's cool. It's cool when that stuff translates. It was so funny on the forum the other day. I got tagged in a post, and it's like, oh, cool. You know, someone you know was probably recommending the tutorial videos or something. Um, and it was a guy saying he's like, um, someone was saying, I'm new to this thing. I don't have a lot of time to tweak. Which patches should I download? And then someone was making a point about you know. You have to try them on your own setup, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, for example, I really like the way Leon's patches sound, but they just sound terrible through my rig. And it was like, and yeah, it, he was sort of like, they're this and they're that. And it was sort of like, oh, okay. That's actually nice to know. That sort of brings me back down to earth that, you know, a lot of the people who like it, you know, say, oh, it's great. And it really works well in my setup, but it's sort of good to know that there's still that element of like, man, you got to dial it in for yourself. Yep. Always, always do. And I don't think that'll ever change regardless if it's tubes or uh, solid state. Yeah, man. Um, Sorry, I kind of derailed the question point, there. No, it's no, that's exactly what I was going for, actually. Um, that 
perfect segue, which is now no longer a perfect segue because I pointed it out. Uh, <laughs> did you ever think growing up playing guitar, because I didn't, um, that we would ever reach this accuracy in digital guitar rig emulation? We've got the Fractal guys, Line 6, Bias, Kemper, and it's not only just in a mix that you can't tell, but I mean, this shit you can blindfold test and you literally can't tell the difference and a lot of the times it just sounds better than the real thing i mean does that blow your mind as much as it does mine yeah yeah big time dude um it's like yeah even um i did a demo of um reaxis by this company called mercurial they got in touch with me one of the guys oh, is yeah. an ax8 user um and said hey i've noticed you like the mark series amps do you want to try this um thing out that models a triaxis and it's like Growing up, my dream rig was a triaxis and a two ninety. You know, that's was mm -hmm. that was like one day I will own a rack that has that, and um, try like even trying that out, it was like I just plugged it in and dialed up a preset, and it was like, whoa, this is amazing! And they make another plugin called Spark, which is like their Marshall thing. Yes, that one I've heard both of those, and yeah, Spark's ridiculous. Man, it's like just the default setting like it's really clever the way they've set it up but it's like you plug it in and it's like whatever the default amp and setting is it's just like it just sounds like appetite for destruction which is like you know yep. i'm not the biggest guns and roses fan but like that's that's what that a lot tone. of people are going for they're going for that tone and it's like plug a les paul in it's like whoa it's right there um but yeah, it's, you know, I, I was really, really lucky growing up. Like I said, my dad plays guitar and, um, you know, I got to hear loud marshals and things like that from a very young age um, where it's, I've just sort of been around, you know, professional grade gear, um, which is really, really fortunate. So it's like, man, the first gig I ever did, I took... <laughs> This was to do a filling gig with a like a pop rock cover band. Um, I took a four twelve, a four space rack, a head and a MIDI controller and two guitars. Um, Damn! And there was just so much gear. Like my car was full of gear. Um, and you know, I did a gig on the weekend where I took a like a double guitar bag and the AX eight. Um, yep. And it was That's like you need anymore. Yeah, and it just it sounded so good. And I I I got an I picked up an Axe FX Ultra. Um like long story short, my buddy Troy, I've mentioned him a few times, he produces our stuff. He bought an Axe FX Ultra like second hand, but like, you know, ten years ago or something when they were still pretty new. Right. I remember he bought it around and plugged it in and I was just like it just floored me how good this thing sounded. You know, it's like he was like, oh, here's a, here's a Marshall sound I've got. And it sounded like my Marshall. Here's like, here's a rectifier kind of sound. And it was huge. Um, and he, he ended up selling that to another friend of ours who plays in a really great band you should check out um, from Perth called Chaos Divine. Uh, they're sort of like a really proggy um, sort of Devon Townsend sort of thing. Like they've got a bit of that going on. Cool. Really cool band. And um, he was using that. And then he bought an AX8. And um, he, I was like, oh, are you going to be selling your Ultra? Because I've sort of been hunting around for something like this. Um, and he was like, definitely, dude, like if you want it. So it's sort of like stayed in the family. And now my dad has it because um, he heard it and just lost his mind. Um, <laughs> and actually, that's a good point because when I was growing up, he had one of the Roland VG8 um things which was like oh you yeah, needed classic like, you needed a hex pickup on it and i remember playing that when i started playing guitar and i was like man this sounds weird there's all these like artifacts in there and you know it's sort of like it sounds the old it sounds digital thing um that's yep. the only way i could describe it at the time and um and i should pull that thing out he's got it he must have it sitting around somewhere all right this is this is this is a good idea for a video at some point. But yeah, yeah I was just about to say that you should you should definitely demo that. I'd yeah, interesting. That'd be so it. funny. Um, ah, that's a very good idea. Anyway, um, but yeah, and then getting getting the ultra, um, and I just got it because it was like, you know, playing 
we had some festivals booked and it's like, okay, cool. I just don't want to deal with backline anymore. Um, you know, sometimes I get a rectifier or I get a DSL. I actually, I got in touch with Mesa. I, I basically got in touch with their like Australian distributor. Um, cause I wanted, I wanted to buy a 212 cab. Um, so I got in touch with them. I was like, what have you got? You know, and they were sort of saying, well, what are you, you know, what are you doing? And I sort of meant just gave them the spiel, you know, and they were like, oh, you know, we can, uh, we can probably offer you artist pricing on that if you're interested. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Great. Um, and they, anyway, I, I ended up getting, getting in touch with their artist rep in the States for when we were going over there. And I was like, look, dude, you know, I, I've only just like, I bought a dual rectifier nine months ago to record our album with and it's my favorite thing in the world do you can i get like a can i loan one or hire one or something and um they were they were really cool about it they basically they were like look we don't have any like we don't keep stock wherever we were going to be like oklahoma or something um but he was mm -hmm. like you know we can put you in touch with a hire company um who will you know they'll they'll look after you sort of thing so I, that was really nice of them. They were super cool, um, which is like why I'll never sell my rectifier because it's such a damn good amp um, and they were nice to me, but the cab clone sucks. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. That's Put that terrible. one on the record. I will say that as a single rectifier op owner as, as well. Awesome yeah. amps, but yeah, they got wrecked by two notes on that one. Yeah, big time. Um, and yeah, anyway, it was sort of like, well, I could do that and we're going to be driving around having to pick up gear or maybe I'll just like, I'll get an Axe FX. I'll just bite the bullet. Um, and for doing a lot of these like fly gigs here, doing mine sites as well, you know, it's like um, a lot of the time they, they just have like cheap modeling, like, you know, the Fender Mustangs and stuff like that. That's the back line. Um, or it's, you know, it's like a blues junior or an AC 15 or something. It's sort of like, I need to take a bunch of pedals to make it work for what we do anyway. So it's like, just give me a mar a Marshall. Like I can live with a Marshall. That'll, that'll be fine. Give me a DSL. That'd be great. Um, so rather than have to deal with that, it was like, I'll just get this. And in my head, it was like, I'll just run it into the tube. You know, I'll, I'll use it as a preamp. Um, and then the more I played with it, the more I was like, man, I could just take this thing. It sounds really good. And then I bought, um, I bought some own hammer impulses and that was like game changer. Um, cause I loaded those in and it was like, wow, now this thing really, these, these sound so much better than the stock, um, cab impulses. Yeah, that's an addiction on its own that I've only started to dabble into. Yeah. It's, it's bad. Oh yeah, dude. It's, oh, oh my God. Um, like I've. <laughs> I've actually got a, I borrowed a bunch of mics off um, my buddy to, and a cabinet I'm going to spend today shooting a bunch of them. So um, I like, I borrowed a Royer and a few things like that, that um, oh, nice. I don't own where it's like, oh yeah, everyone seems to be using this microphone. It's $1,800. Uh, maybe I won't buy one. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just borrow one off a friend. So um, but doing that and just then borrow it, make an IR of it, be done with it <laughs> pretty much, man. Yeah. And, um, that, yeah, that, that really started the descent into the rabbit hole. And then I started watching videos, um, and I kind of just like the functionality of the XFX2 and the AX8 sort of sold me. There were just so many more parameters and just so much easier to get a good sound. Um, yeah, over there, like the ultra still sounds really good, you know? Um, but yeah, the, the neck, they just, they really nailed it with the AX8, man. It's such a, such an accessible tool for guitar players. Yeah. I've, I've recommended it to, to pretty much everyone of all ages. And it, it seems it's, it's catching on a little bit better. I, I was wondering with the, you know, the, the use of digital guitar rigs, um, MIDI automation, backing tracks, click tracks, drum samples, all these mm -hmm niceties that we've come to expect in live shows um does it take away some of the magic for you i don't know what all ragdoll uses in in that vein but um you know i know you're a you're still a real gear guy so does you know using all of those things that make a band tighter and 
uh, more well produced, uh, you know, make it less fun or less real for you? Um, it's kind of the it's kind of the opposite. I mean, our bass player Ryan has been using a Sans amp forever. Like he he got one when we toured the states. Like, and I was like, man, you're crazy. Like, you need to buy a rig. Um, and I spent like you know two days at Guitar Center trying to pick something out. Um, and he was he just had this Sans amp and. It was sort of like seeing that. It was like, oh, no, you can get away with plugging into anything if you've got a cool piece of gear like that. And he still uses it. So he's sort of been using the bass driver forever. Um, and I love his bass sound. And it's like every show, people come up to him and say, man, how do you do that? And it's like, oh, I just plug this into the PA. Um, and um, so, yeah, uh, f for us, it's... <laughs> It helps us compete with the big boys, basically. Right. You know, it's like, especially when you're doing like when you're doing support slots. Um, you know, you haul your you haul your amp onto stage, and you can't turn it up loud. And the sound guy doesn't care; he just chucks like a fifty-seven right on the cone. <laughs> and yeah, up so you get. <sighs> yeah, you know, so it's just like white noise. Um, so. It, it takes that element out of it. And then for me, it makes it more fun because I spend less time setting up. I can actually, like, I just walk on stage, I plug an XLR in, I plug a guitar cable in, um, I tune up, I make sure I can hear myself out of the monitors, I make sure everybody else can hear me. And then the 10 or 15 minutes that I would spend plugging things in and turning knobs, um, I can go and just chill out and sort of get in, get in a headspace um, where I'm like ready to play, which is normally like, you know, have a, have a bottle of water and just kind of soak in the fact that I'm getting to play music. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, that's definitely an advantage, not having to haul real stuff. The only thing I think I would miss direct and I've heard differing opinions on it from bands I like is um, I'm good with like digital preamps, all that good stuff. Um, I would use IRs over the PA any day for the reason you described of sound mm -hmm. guys just not giving a shit. Yep. Um, but I, I think I would miss the air movement of a real cabinet. Do you ever uh, feel that way or is it just kind of like to be expected now? Um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I think I'm used to it now. Um, like we opened up for Saliva a few weeks ago and um, we, we actually mm. got a decent sound check um at the venue and it was like it was a really meaty sounding pa and it was loud and um it it had that movement it, like i could feel you know could like feel it in my guts feel it in my balls basically where it's like you hear the bass and the kick drum and the guitar together and it really it made stuff shake so that i didn't miss but uh it's it's <laughs> Uh, I'm almost not the best person to talk to about it because a lot of the time I just don't care. It's like as long as as long as long I'm playing in time and I'm in tune, if I can't hear myself, as long as the show's going good, like that's all that really matters to me. So um, that's it's almost like become an afterthought. Like, oh, maybe you should actually enjoy listening to your guitar sound when you play live. It's more, I'm sort of more just a guy who gets off on... Um, performing and you know presenting the sort of the show and we like we don't use tracks um but i think for the next but like our drummer bought a role in spdsx so um we want to start experimenting with some you know some live triggers and things like that just to and you know it's like we've been um doing this stuff for like seven or eight years now so it's it'd be kind of cool to just have some different sounds happening on stage in a few places um just because you know it's I'm, like i'm a huge fan of rush so um i always loved how they incorporated keyboards and sampling and they they triggered it all live which i thought was super cool yeah it's i think it's good to hear a, a different perspective because I often hear so many times of, oh, we're, it's no longer real music. You know, Tony Iommi and Jimi Hendrix had to play um, the pedal board dance every time they wanted to change their sound, and you should have to as well, and yeah. <laughs> all this stuff. So I, I think it's refreshing to hear someone that just says, hey, if it sounds good, 
fuck it, keep going. Yeah, man. And, uh, I think that's what the audience cares about the most. They don't care if you have an Axe Effects or a 5150 in the back. If it sounds the same, they're going to you know, jam out and be done with it. Yeah, man. And it's like, I have played my direct rig through the shittest PAs you have ever seen. <laughs> and it's worked. Like, we played this, like, basement in France where the... <laughs> Yeah, it was just, like, the opening band rocked up with JMP-era 2203 Marshalls that were the in the most pristine condition I've ever seen. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Maybe this is, maybe these guys are just going to destroy us because they've got these really cool rigs. And it right. sucked. Like, they were so <laughs> loud and uncontrollable in this small room. And, um, you know, like, the vocal PA had, like, eight-inch speakers or something. It was a pretty small oh, system. God. Yeah, it, you know, uh, I think there was a sub somewhere in there, in the room, but it was it was pretty ghetto. Um, and, yeah, we just ran direct, and it, it was more appropriate for the room, you know? Um, so it's, it's definitely scalable. The other thing I'll say about the AX-8 is that um, I was doing this uh, gig, I think, on the Friday night, and... Um, the other guitar player who was singing, um, he called out a song, like, you know, let's play whatever it is. I forget what it was. but um, And then he went to grab his his beer, which was full, a whole pint of beer, and he dropped it. Oh, and the whole no. thing spilled all over the AX-8. Like, the entire beer. Just, like, <laughs> all over it. It was a disaster, and we looked at each other, and, it, you know, this is one of the luxuries, I guess, of playing in a two-guitar band, which I'm not really used to. I was like, okay, cool, dude, you just play the song and sing, and I went and, like, ran behind the bar and got a bunch of, um, like, a bunch of rags and stuff, and I just, like, mopped up his pedal board, um, and, yeah, and it's fine, you know, like, it survived, so it's definitely roadworthy stuff, which is cool. Um, awesome yeah which yeah, that's always sickening i've i've like splashed some beer on my uh cabinet before and it's just oh god it's sickening so i i understand why people like dave mustaine have like cages around their yeah, shit yeah yeah big time and i've often thought about that it's like man if if this goes down it's uh, i got i got nothing but then again it's like you know you get you blow a fuse on a tube amp and you don't have the right type of fuse. You're, you're also equally yeah. screwed. So, um, yeah, it's man, it's it really is. And this is a thing. Like, I'm sure you get the same thing. Like, what do you think of the Kemper? What do you think of the Helix? What do you think of anything? And it's like, yeah, we're just at that level where it's like that's just pick one and run with it. And it's more about what you put in. That's important. Yeah, I, I made a video of that exactly, of that topic, and that's basically my conclusion as well, is at, at a certain price point nowadays, you're not going to get bad gear. They're, they're all going to have certain you know areas where they excel over the others, but yeah. you know, if you tinker with it enough, get familiar with it, you'll be able to get what you want out of it. So, But again, it goes back to that whole brand loyalty and pissing contest thing where People don't like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, like I, one of my friends, um, he came around, he wanted to buy a digital rig and he tried the AX-8 and I ran it through him and he ended up buying a Kemper um, and he lent it to me and I totally understand why he bought the Kemper because it sits on his desktop and, you know, he just scrolls a knob and it brings up a brand new rig and then he plays and that's his, you know, that's his vibe. If he wants to connect it to a cabinet, it's all kind of there. So it's, um, and it wasn't until I actually played one that it was like, ah, oh, I understand why people really love these things, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Because if it's, if you want, if you want the experience of still playing a traditional rig, that's the thing that's closest to it, you know? It's a really clever piece of gear right. um, in terms of the user interface and things. And yeah, and like a lot of guys, you know, who use the Line 6 Helix or something, I get that it makes sense. They don't want to, sit in front of a computer and use an editor or something. It's like, got a great user interface. Um, the the fractal stuff for me was just, it, man, it's just, most of it sounds better than the real thing, you know? Um, yep. It's like, 
they, my sentiments exactly. Yeah, you know, it's like my rectifier sounds pretty good and it's got a particular character to it, but I get that like amazing feeling from it like once a week maybe or like it it'll work in a particular song where it's like, "Oh, cool. I'm using the AX8. I've got a rectifier thing. Well, I've got a bunch of like rec- other things that are in that like genre of amp that if it's not quite working, I can bring it up and dial it in and it might work better in a track. Um, right. Which, which is so cool. But yeah, they're just like, you know, it's, um, it's a, it really is an amazing piece of gear. Um, and now there's an, the next, next generation thing happening. So it'll be very interesting to see how, what they get out of that new Axe FX3 platform as well. Definitely. I cannot wait for the whole channel switching because it, even right now, just X, Y switching works good enough for me most of the time because like my rectifier has a very small dropout going between the, uh, the channel. So it's like, I've learned to work around it. And especially yep. if it was, you know, automated to a MIDI, it wouldn't even really be problematic for me. So to be able to do that with four models in the same preset is just unfreaking believable. It's, it's, uh, yeah, definitely farther than I'd ever thought we'd get. You just do it all with one preset, basically. So, uh, speaking of gear, one of the hallmarks I think of your channel is uh, all your thumbnails. You can see the wall of guitars that sits yes. behind you. Yep. Uh, how many do you have? Because th- that looks like an epic collection. Um, man, I it, this is the ongoing question. Um, I think the correct answer is, you know, there's that meme which is like let let x be the current number of guitars i own then the ideal number of guitars is x plus one yep absolutely um but yeah it's um and like you know again like a qualifier i was so lucky you know my my dad's a guitar player and it's the the lines between there is no line between what's each of ours you know kind of thing it's like we just have this blurred collection of things um I just kind of annexed his entire collection of cool stuff. So, um, <laughs> uh, it's, it would, it's somewhere in the forties. Um, that is awesome. Yeah. Life goals. Yeah, man. It's, um, you know, again, it's like, if we were talking about like, you know, if this was like tool time with Tim Allen, no one's getting excited about owning 40 screwdrivers, but you know, guitars are, they're beautiful things to look at. Um, Right. <clears throat> and they're, they're nice things to own. And, you know, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't gamble. I, like, I don't really have any vices like that. That's my, that's my vice is, you know, cool guitars. Right. So Yeah, there's, there's worse things to have for sure. Yeah, man, big time. Um, and same thing, you know, with, with the amp thing, it's just, um, I've been teaching guitar since I was like 16. So um, as soon as I had like, money to buy pedals and gear it's like that's sort of all i spent my income on and um uh, i i sold a lot of those pedals to get an axe effects and it's sort of like i wish you know i wish that stuff was around when i was 16 or 17 because it would have been just amazing to just go straight to it and you know spend the money and the time on on other things yeah you can you can never have too much of that stuff and that's i i caution people the Similarly, when people talk about like, oh, I'm thinking about selling these two guitars. I don't play much or these, this pedal board to afford this thing that you're demoing. And I'm always like, I don't know. In a couple of years, you might look back and think I could have waited two more months and had both. Because, I mean, you do assign <clears throat> sentimental value to, to that kind of stuff, even if you don't realize it. Yeah, big time, man. Um, it's one of those things where it's sometimes you go like, oh, maybe I'll just get rid of it. And it's like, actually, that would have been really handy and back to that question you were saying about you know the does the whole digital guitar rig kind of i guess sanitize the process um while it makes things and the whole drum sample thing as well and it's at the end of the day it's got to be about character for me um you know and if you're playing a gig or you're recording a track it's like you want to you want it to have a unique character and you want it to stand out and it doesn't matter what you use to get that um um there's there's and you know with guitar players and pedals especially 
there's this huge huge aesthetic thing about having a big pedal board with a bunch of like hand selected things and it's it's kind of like the whole um uh like you know foodie thing where it's like oh, i'm using this like sumatran coffee bean with a <laughs> truffle from mount everest and um it's like yeah well just because it's from a cool place doesn't mean that it's going to have a particular character it's like um and especially you know recording it's um i think a good example of what i'm talking about with like character tones like when you know you listen to mastodon and it's like you know they're they're doing something where like every part and every riff kind of has its own thing happening tonally and um every song and every one of their albums the way they've like developed is just there's just cool sounds everywhere uh, it's not just like oh we got a 5150 and vintage 30s and put a 57 in front of it and you know that's good enough it's like right. they're a good example of a band but you know it's like everything well, you can just i just get off on putting on headphones and listening to what they're doing with the sounds you know it's um a uh, devon townsend's another guy as well you know there's just so much so much layering happening but he's an axe effects guy you know um we're watching his and it all goes back to these guys we're talking about could play through a marshall mg15 and still sound freaking epic so if you don't have that exactly you know as a as a baseline it doesn't matter how many boutique products you use uh you're still gonna sound like crap yeah i mean it's like it's not like you get philosophers sitting around um for two hours talking about the type of paper they like to use exactly i'm sure that i'm sure there are some that would but um <laughs> you know it's more about they sit around they talk about the ideas and um anything that can get you closer to that i'm a big fan of which is why i have a digital rig and why i have pedals and why i have different guitars and um it's all it's it's all got to be appropriate for um you know what you're trying to achieve i guess so um you've made quite a few videos with the uh, the two notes captor and that's something i'm starting to venture in a little bit direct stuff with real amps yep um i've got a load box that sucks it says right. it's reactive it's barely reactive it's one of the, like you look at the the you know this frequency spectrum it's like oh i can see a little bit of a bump on the lower and higher frequencies but yeah um it sounds like that's working out great for you is that something you would wholeheartedly recommend um does it get that real speaker response the the one thing that uh and this is this is an interesting point of discussion um and a few people um have mentioned it to me is that it's not really a big issue for me because i'm not a mix engineer but a few guys i've spoken to who have tried it um when it comes to like actually mixing something that they've noticed um that using that as opposed to using the same amp mic'd um is just a little bit easier to mix um gotcha easier to get it like you have to do less to it but um man for like i don't know what it would be in american dollars but it's like 2.99 australian it's like it was a no-brainer it's like man it's yeah it's pretty good um it's everything i'd need and then you know if you've got an ax8 or something there's your impulse loader um right that's exactly the way i would use it and in the meantime i just run there's a raw output on that and like the slave output on mesa boogie amps yep, that you get the cool. di signal mm -hmm. you know um and so but when you compare that the di signal to when the cabinets connected versus the load box it is you know day and night and i don't want to drop more cash on on the wrong direction you know what i mean yeah the the one and the sort of like you know the the math nerd in me comes out with this is like from what i understand and again this is from what i understand i can't confirm this um the when you're looking at the way a guitar amplifier interacts with a speaker um <sighs> I think they use like a second order load or something like that as like an approximation of a Correct. of a speaker. So um whereas something like a fourth or fifth order load would be more appropriate. You get those big swoops in the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. So um you know, having said that, using it with a good impulse 
I think the impulse makes a way bigger difference um, to the overall thing. Um, so it's like that plus some really well well shot impulses is probably going to sound better than some okay impulses and a more accurate load. So um, it's it's sort of like all within that range of tweakability. Um, because I know Fractal make a load box and it's like, I was looking yeah. at it, it's like, that's pretty interesting. I'd like to try it and AB them, but it's about double the cost of the two notes captor. So yeah, that- how much, how much better can you get? Yeah. I mean, so many people are using the two notes torpedo live and that's kind of the, my whole thing with Fractal as well is you see how many touring bands put this shit through their yeah, paces man. and the sound the way they do. So I figured it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably yeah. try it out sooner rather than later. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's I I I use it, you know, which is um, more than I can say than a lot of the gear I've bought. <laughs> it's a godsend for doing pedal demos because I can use, you know, like a pedal into an amp into the load box, and if somebody complains like, "Oh, why did you use vintage thirties?" It's like I can do it. I can easily do it with vintage 30s and greenbacks and something yep. else, you know, um, just to sort of give them a more realistic, you know, it's like a more diverse way of looking at how it might work in a few different rigs. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea because that's, I, I see that a lot. I'm I'm generally a, a V30s dude, but... Oh, me too, uh, man. Yeah, a lot of people think, oh, it's, it would have sounded so much better if you used that and that's a good rebuttal. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I can do it again if you like, you know. Um, yeah. Which is which is definitely the nice part about it. Um, and yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's like it's a it's a worthwhile investment um, for like a home studio or even just a studio in general. You know, um, there's you can definitely there's definitely more than one application you can use it for, which is pretty cool. Being that Ragdoll is a three piece, back to uh, you're playing live. Um, do you find that it's difficult to be a single guitar band do you take that in consideration when you you know set up your presets when you write your material you know do you think about that kind of stuff like oh this solo has to sound fuller here because i don't have a backing guitar like what goes into that process because i write everything that there would be you know two guitars yeah um i guess a lot of the a lot of the thing for us is like my my favorite band's king's x um my other favorite band's rush um amongst you know like a hundred favorite bands that i have um and they're both bands that have very distinct bass guitar tones um and i like if you listen to some of our stuff and you really listen to the bass as well um ryan like he uses quite like a sort of split it's a very modern kind of bass sound like you know clean low end dirty top end um right and i just i just love the way he he plays bass together with Cam, our drummer. They do a lot of, I think we kind of make use of that space. Whereas like, you know, if it's a solo section, it's like, okay, rather than go for like a wall of sound kind of thing that I'm going to solo over, have some rhythmic accents um, that or like some very distinct hits. And, and they're really good at like, you know, when we're writing, it's like, okay, if there's going to be a solo section, what can we do that's, unique to that section of the song which is kind of going to be make it rather than it be about sounding full or anything what's going to make it interesting to listen to um gotcha so yeah basically they do all the work in that in that kind of thing but for me my solo patch i always just add like two or three db of a flat boost um and like a delay which is um normally would be like a long-ish like maybe like a quarter note and a dotted eighth note at you know i'll i'll use the tap tempo on the ax8 to like tap half time um and then that gives me like a nice wide um especially if you're playing in stereo it's really cool but it just i find having a little bit of delay on the signal and a little bit of a volume boost lets me kind of pop out and um and then it's more about, you know, trying to trying to play stuff that again, like sort of has rather than be like super flashy, um, more just be about like it's cool, like there's cool notes in there or cool sounds and um 
something that's going to make that's going to make you want to listen to it. Um, so yeah, that's more sort of my approach with that is like embrace the fact that there's space um, right. and and use it to your advantage if possible. With a, a lot of the time when I'm writing rhythm parts as well, it's like, you know, thinking about, cool, I can play like a power chord down low and then add different notes on the top. So it's almost like having, having, I often think of them as like dual parts, even though I'm trying to play them as one part. Yeah, I was just curious because I've seen many three pieces that, you know, record their music as if they're a four piece. Mm. And then when you try to replicate that live, it's just a recipe for disaster. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you guys recognize your limitations in that aspect yeah. and yet embrace it as an advantage. I think it's the right way to go about it. Yeah, big time. And, you know, we've got lots of like live videos up, which are like crappy cameras and stuff like that. And I always think it sounds okay. So, um, but there's always there's always that person at a gig who's like, oh, it'd be pretty cool to hear you guys with a second guitar player. And it's like, yeah, we we went down that road at one point and it did not work out. So that's kind of why we uh, why we avoid it. Yeah, I think if you start out as whatever you start out as is kind of what you need to stay. Because I was not a big fan of like the the uh, double guitar years of Motorhead, for instance. Oh my I, gosh! I always prefer yeah. Always prefer just having fast Eddie. Yep, precisely, man. There's, I remember watching um, the British show The Young Ones and Motorhead are on there and they're like, they're miming, but there's two guitar players. And I was like, man, this is just, this is just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, I, I mean, you can't imagine some of these three pieces with another one like Sleep or Rush, especially. It was, yeah, they need to stick with what they do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you know, like sleep, their thing is that they're just louder than everybody else and it sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's probably part of the magic is you gotta you gotta tame your amps if you're you got two of them up there, but Yep. Big time. That's cool. So any uh any future plans for ragdolls or new material you guys are writing, upcoming shows, long term aspirations you're working? Towards? Well, aside from, you know, just becoming a shill for every major gear company. Um, Amen to uh, that. Yeah. Um, we are, we're writing at the moment, basically. Well, we've kind of like written an album's worth of material and we're just about to start the phase where we're going to go back and like polish everything up. And um, we're just sort of in the middle of drawing up like a timeline to, you know, commit to some studio time and get back in and, um, do that and then sort of plan you know touring and stuff like that around around that and um there's been you know there's been a bunch of things that have happened in the last six months nine months with um uh like ryan's um family basically like he had he had another kid at the end of last year and then uh his eldest son got really sick at the start of this year so it was sort of like it was, you know, in a way it was, you know, it was all that kind of stuff's obviously stressful for him, but in a way it was just nice to go like, you know what, everybody just like chill out and focus on just being people and spending time with your families and that right. kind of thing. So it's been nice to have that sort of downtime to reevaluate everything and go, you know what, like, I just still like playing these songs and playing with these guys and um being able to get that perspective on it where it's like it's worth all the hard work and all the you know the difficulties that arise from trying to be a band in australia trying to push your music overseas and um you know all the logistics of touring and traveling and stuff like that it's to get some downtime from and go you know what it's actually we're, we're in a very privileged position and we're lucky to be able to do it so you know let's let's strap up and try to make try to make another record that we're really proud of um and do it in a way that's like fun and constructive that's cool i'm glad you're in the you know free position to do that and definitely wish you guys major success i'm you turned me into a fan for sure oh so, man that's, uh, that's really that's really, really enjoy awesome your stuff. to hear really awesome to hear and um i i should ask the same question i guess what obviously the podcast is going to be cool do you have 
are you allowed to give away any information about who you have next or who you're planning to have on um or any yeah I've, I've reached out um not heard responses yet <laughs> right uh definitely want to keep this up uh love to have you back on obviously there's plenty more we we could talk about i'm oh, sure man, definitely um i could go on like this for, for hours and hours yeah for sure um if uh on on that note if anyone that's listening has you know a particular suggestion or um wants you know hook up someone then i'm open for for that as well but um yeah as far as goals go um i think i've kind of settled in into the the way i, I want to make videos the kind of stuff i want to do um said when i started this a little over a year ago i had no idea i just um to touch on that momentarily, I actually did a video game YouTube channel for a couple years with a friend and it, you know, dismal performance because it's just <laughs> that bubble busted. Um, but I learned that I like to make videos, so kept doing it and I wanted to turn it into something I was more passionate about. And Very interesting. Um, really my goals as such is just to uh, refine that for the next year and uh, kind of keep doing what I'm doing and hopefully build more you know connections and networking like like we are now um and i'd like to like legitimately get started on at least one of the things i'm working on i think i'm leaning towards a uh more southern rock flavored oh um, it's kind of metal cool. but kind of not um yeah project i think that's the one that i'm, I'm passionate about at the moment and i uh, would love to have some guest soloists on it including yourself if you'd be oh, interested dude, that would be amazing that would be so fun so cool. That sounds awesome. Lock it um, in. Yeah, Let's I guess it. we'll. Be All right, I'll definitely pencil you in. I've got a couple songs in mind, and uh, I'll I'll send them to you. See see which one you like better. Wicked man, please do, please do. All right, I will. So uh, yeah, before we wrap this up, just huge thank you for coming on, man. Just for um, everyone's reference, it's currently eleven fifty four in the morning where I live. It's eleven fifty four at night where Leon lives. So he's got some some dedication to the, to do this thing. Um, there's anything you'd like to shout out, tell everyone where you can, uh, they can find you and, and your band go for it. Uh, of course. Well, thanks for listening to me rattle on incoherently at times. Uh, if you are interested in ragdoll, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash ragdoll rock. All our stuff is available on Spotify, Apple music, Bandcamp. Um, and that kind of thing. If you want to, you know, dip your toes into the water, it's what I would be doing if I was listening to a podcast and some guy said, check out my music. Um, it's on all the major digital platforms. And if you do like it, uh, you can, you can buy it on CD and you can also buy it on vinyl as well. And then if you want to check out my YouTube channel, my name on YouTube is Leon Todd with two D's. And uh, yeah, come and come and leave a comment, and you know, check out some some gear reviews. I make a few videos a week, so uh, there's always new stuff going up. And um, otherwise, find me on Twitter and Instagram, and you know, the whole shebang. So it's been an absolute privilege being on this. Uh, my first experience uh, doing something like this, um, which isn't like a kind of you know. Um, here are the same 10 questions that I ask everyone sort of thing. So um, credit to you, man. I really hope this goes well for you because this was a lot of fun and I'll be tuning in. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad I'm glad it went uh, as smoothly as it did for the first time because I have literally no experience doing this as well. But uh, yeah, I thought hopefully we'd be able to uh, nail out some, some topical points that, like you said, aren't just the same 10 questions every hard rock interviewer yeah. asks. Yeah, exactly, dude. No, it was awesome. All right, well, uh, awesome. Appreciate you taking time out of your day. My pleasure, man. Um, that'll be about that for that episode here. And uh, tune in sometime. I don't know the frequency of this stuff yet. It'll pretty much be as um, as people are available. But um, yeah, I had a blast. Hope we can do this again sometime. And um, with that, go check out Leon. Thanks, guys. <laughs>